the work on C. elegans, set 3 and mammalian eyes that we discussed in the last section was published in 1994. Around the same time, Donald Nicholson, Douglas Miller and their co-workers at Merck Research Laboratories were working on the identification of a factor involved in apoptosis that turned out to be another member of the caspase family of proteases. What had been found by a couple of investigators a few years earlier is that a protein called POP, which stands for poly-ADP ribose polymerase, is cleaved in apoptotic cells. Interestingly, the amino acid sequence of one of the cleavage sites of POP is similar to the amino acid sequence of one of the cleavage sites in interleukin 1 beta, which is cleaved by ice. It is DEBD in the case of POP and FEAD in the case of interleukin 1 beta. And in both cases, cleavage occurs after the fourth amino acid, the aspartic acid residue. The team around Donald Nicholson and Douglas Miller therefore decided to identify this POP cleavage enzyme using a biochemical approach. So far, we have mainly talked about genetic approaches. The cancer genetic approach, using follicular lymphoma as a model that led to the identification of BCL2, and the forward genetic approach, using C. elegans as a model that led to the identification of EGO1, Z9, Z4, and Z3. Remember, these classical genetic approaches are based on the identification of mutants with specific phenotypes, which are caused by changes in the DNA, by mutations. Using this approach, genes can be identified in an unbiased manner that are involved in a particular process of interest, such as apoptosis. A biochemical approach is an equally powerful, unbiased tool for gene discovery. However, it is based on the reconstitution in a test tube or in vitro of a process of interest from cellular components. Once such a process can be reconstituted in vitro, the minimal set of cellular components can be identified that are sufficient for this process. I like the following comparison to demonstrate the differences between a genetic and a biochemical approach. Let's say a geneticist and a biochemist both want to find out what makes a car run. The geneticist would take out one part at a time and then try whether the car still starts. Taking out a seat or the bumper would have no effect, but taking out the engine would. The biochemist would take the entire car apart into individual pieces. Among all those pieces, he would then try to find the minimal set of pieces that, when put together, provides him or her with something that can be started, such as an engine. What is as important for gene discovery using a biochemical approach as it is for gene discovery using a genetic approach is a good assay. Remember, Alice and Horvitz used the Z1 mutant background and then the Ego 1 mutant background as an assay for their genetic screens. To be good, an assay needs to be specific, easy and fast, so that in the case of a biochemical approach, you can go through lots of different samples very quickly. What did the team around Donald Nicholson and Douglas Miller decided to use as an assay to identify the POP cleavage enzyme? Of course, they used POP cleavage. POP was generated in vitro using a transcription translation system and radioactively labeled with S35 methionine so that small amounts of it could be detected by autoradiography. If a protein is radioactively labeled, you basically only need a tiny amount of it in order to see and follow it. 
When run next to a protein standard on a polyacrylamide gel, the uncleaved full-length PAR protein could be detected at around 113 kilodaltons or KD. However, when they incubated the PAR protein with the cell lysate that had been generated from apoptotic cells, then some additional bands were detectable on the gel. Apart from the 113 KD band, another one was detected at around 89 KD and one at around 24 KD. The protein running at 89 KD and the protein running at 24 KD are the cleavage products of PARP once PARP is cleaved. This was a great assay because they were looking for the appearance of these two additional bands. What is it in the cell lysate generated from apoptotic cells that causes PARP cleavage that causes the appearance of these two additional bands? Cell lysates have thousands of different proteins in them. How can you find the PARP cleavage enzyme in the cell lysate? It is like looking for the needle in a haystack. You separate the cell lysate and therefore the proteins in them using certain criteria such as size or charge and then you assay the different fractions obtained for their activity. Basically their ability to cause PARP cleavage in the test tube. Such a separation of mixtures of for example proteins is also referred to as chromatography. As a first step Nicholson, Miller and co-workers used anion exchange chromatography to generate different fractions of proteins. In this type of chromatography, positively charged resin or solid support is used to fish out of the cell lysate negatively charged molecules. And they found that the activity was now restricted to a few fractions of proteins that had a certain negative charge. When they pulled these fractions and ran them on a polyacrylamide gel, they still found that the mixture contained many different proteins. As a next step, they did something really clever. Remember that the amino acid sequence around the PARP cleavage site is DEVD, the four amino acids, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, valine, and aspartic acid. They thought that a DVD peptide, when added to the cell lysate, might block the ability of the PARP cleavage enzyme to cleave PARP. They tested it in their in vitro assay and found that yes, the DVD peptide could block the cleavage. Based on this, they reasoned that this peptide most likely blocked PARP cleavage because it bound to the PARP cleavage enzyme, thereby preventing its ability to bind and cleave PARP. As a next chromatography step, they therefore took a resin to which the DEVD peptide was coupled. And with this, they fished out of the mixture of negatively charged proteins that they had obtained using the anion exchange resin, those proteins that could bind to DEVD. Chromatography that takes advantage of the abilities of two molecules to interact is also referred to as affinity chromatography. When they checked on a polyacrylamide gel how many proteins there were that could bind to DEVD, they found only two. One of a molecule mass of around 17 kD and one of around 11 kD. These two proteins turn out to be the two subunits of another caspase, initially referred to as CPP32 and now referred to as caspase 3. Caspase 3 turns out to be the actual Z3 homologue in mammals. Like Z3 and ICE, caspase 3 is formed as an inactive zymogen or procaspase and the fully active enzyme is generated through proteolytic cleavage. The identification of caspase 3 was published in 1995 in the journal Nature. And one additional important finding reported in this publication 
was that the DEBD peptide, which they found blocked the ability of caspase 3 to cleave POP in vitro, could also block apoptosis in mammalian cells grown in culture. This was a significant finding as well. It demonstrated that the activity of this caspase is necessary for apoptosis. The identification of the first caspases was an important advance that really moved the field forward. It moved the field forward because it added components with known enzymatic activities, proteolytic activities, to the apoptotic process in both C. elegans and mammals. It also confirmed that the process was conserved beyond the BCL2 superfamily. And the finding that the expression of BCL2 could block caspase-induced death allowed the field to start establishing pathways. As we discussed in one of the last sections, using epistasis analyses, a genetic pathway had been established in C. elegans. This pathway is linear and is composed of the genes Ega1, Z9, Z4, and Z3. Ega1 and Z9 encode members of the BCL2 superfamily, Z4 a protein of unknown function, and Z3 a caspase. Ega1 is pro-apoptotic and negatively regulates Z9. Z9 is anti-apoptotic and negatively regulates the pro-apoptotic Z4. And Z4 positively regulates the pro-apoptotic apoptotic Z3, the expression of which can then induce apoptosis. Based on this genetic pathway in C. elegans, the functional characterization of the BCL2 superfamily and the observation that BCL2 is somehow involved in controlling the activity of caspase 3, the homologue of Z3, a similar pathway could be started to be drawn in mammals. In this pathway, the caspases act downstream to commit cells to the apoptotic fate. And upstream of the caspases now, the BCL2 superfamily acts with the sensors, guardians, and effectors, and with the sensors directly or indirectly activating the effectors. How might members of the BCL2 superfamily control the activity or activation of caspases. Can they do it directly? Can the effectors directly bind to procaspases and cause their activation? To find out, Zhao Dong and his co-workers then at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta used a biochemical approach. Their goal was to identify the factors required for the proteolytic cleavage and therefore activation of procaspases and procaspase 3 in particular. As an assay, they used the cleavage of procaspase 3 into its P17 and P11 subunits. To that end, they in vitro transcribed and translated an S35 methionine labeled full-length procaspase 3 and incubated it with the cell lysate generated from tissue culture cells, actually HeLa cells. And just a couple of words about HeLa cells, which some of you might have heard of already or might even have worked with already. The HeLa cell line is an immortal human cell line. It is actually the first human cell line isolated and it is also the most commonly used human cell line even today. It was derived in 1951 from a cervical cancer removed from a patient with the name of Henrietta Lacks, who died of cancer that same year. HeLa cells have been an important tool for numerous biochemical and cell biological studies, not only in cancer research, but also in the life sciences. Going back to the cleavage assay with procaspase 3. After incubating full-length procaspase 3 with the HeLa cell lysate, Zhao Dong Wang and co-workers ran the in vitro reaction on a polyacrylamide gel to look at the status of caspase 3. 
and they found that the incubation with the HeLa cell lysate was sufficient to cause cleavage into P17 and P11. To confirm that what had been generated through this cleavage in vitro indeed was the active enzyme, the active caspase, they incubated part of their cleavage reaction with either full-length pop or with nuclei isolated from hamster liver. Why did they incubate those reactions with POP? As we discussed earlier, POP was already known to be cleaved by caspase 3. It was the first substrate of caspase 3 identified. It was actually through POP cleavage that caspase 3 was identified in the first place. But why nuclei? Nuclei contain the chromosomes and therefore the DNA. Remember the discovery that in apoptotic cells, DNA fragments into typical DNA ladders provided one of the first molecule clues about the apoptotic process. It suggested that endonucleases are activated in apoptotic cells. What Zhao Dong Wang and co-workers found is that in contrast to full-length procaspase 3, the P17 and P11 fragments generated in vitro were sufficient to cause POP cleavage and also DNA ladder formation in vitro. This confirmed that with the observed cleavage into the P17 and P11 fragments, the active caspase had been generated. Their assay therefore worked. What is it now in the HeLa cell lysate that causes cleavage of procaspase 3? They used a series of different chromatography steps. And at the end, they were left with three different fractions, each containing only one protein. And they had to incubate procaspase 3 with all three to get procaspase 3 cleavage. Leaving one of these proteins out resulted in no procaspase 3 cleavage. Therefore, all three proteins were required. The three proteins present in these fractions were called APEF1, APEF2, and APEF3, which stands for apoptotic protease activating factors 1, 2, and 3.